Voting in Senegal's presidential election has now closed. It's not clear whether any of the 19 candidates will win more than 50% of the vote and avoid a runoff. Uh, two have emerged as favourites. The election comes after months of unrest following President Macky Sall's attempt to postpone the vote until the end of the year. Senegal is considered one of West Africa's most stable democracies. Many Senegalese lined up to cast their votes despite fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. For them, it's a decisive election for their country's future. This election is really, really important because it marks the break between the old system we're fighting and the new system. The old system is a reference to the rule of President Macky Sall and his coalition. The outgoing president has ruled the country for almost a decade. Last month, he announced he was postponing the election. The move plunged Senegal into chaos, setting off widespread deadly protests and a constitutional crisis. Saal finally backtracked and the country went ahead with the election. There have been many protests, many deaths. We hope the next president will be able to maintain order in the country at all levels, at the level of the country's ministries and institutions. The governing party's candidate is former Prime Minister Amadou Ba. He believes he has a good chance to win. Morale is very good. We've done what we had to do. We campaigned throughout the country and presented our programme. I am very, very, very confident. I am very, very confident. His main challenger is Basiro Diomai Fai. He's backed by popular opposition politician Usman Sonko. Both were released from jail this month. They say that charges against them were politically motivated. Sonko, a fierce critic of the incumbent president, is himself barred from running. Fai believes Sonko's backing may help him win. I remain confident that there will be a political change of direction and that I am the best person to make that change, especially after seeing the jubilant reception people have given us all over Senegal. Many Senegalese are hoping this election result may finally bring back stability to their country. I spoke with political analyst uh, Chris Ogomodede in the Senegalese capital, Dhaka, and he summed up the day. It's been a pretty regular day. Uh, folks have gone about their business. They've gone to vote. You know, the polls opened as early as 8 a.m. And uh, certainly when I got up to go out in the morning, folks were already camped outside, ready to vote. Uh, many people have cast their votes. Uh, well, at this point, the polls have closed, but people came out early, they cast their votes early, and they went back to their homes and to the other activities of the day. So it's been a pretty regular day for the most part. And uh, who's getting the most, who's been getting the most attention in this uh, massive field of 19 candidates? Well, there are two people considered to be the front runners, the former Prime Minister Ahmadou Ba and uh, Basiru Jomai Fai. Um, but there are 18, there are 18 candidates uh, who are running, but those two are believed to have the best chance of winning as far as if there will be a decisive result in the first round, that remains to be seen. Lots of folks don't believe there will be because the folks believe there will not be a candidate who will score above the 50% required to win outright in the first round. But, you know, the results have yet to come in, so we'll see. Okay, so if it does go to a runoff, uh, when does that happen? If it goes to a runoff, that will happen next week because the uh, handover to uh, President Macky Sall's successor will happen on April 1st, you know, which is how all of these um, confusions happened in the first place. But uh, that's scheduled to happen next week if necessary. And so what are the most pressing issues facing Senegal's next president? First and foremost, the economy, without a doubt. When you talk to folks 
around the country, not just in Dakar, wherever else you go, whether it's San Luis or Kaolak or wherever, it's the economy. You know, Nominally, Senegal has actually grown economically. It's been uh, projected by the IMF to grow by as much as 10% this year because of the uh, um, oil and gas sector, which is about to take off. But it's one of those cases of growth without development, really. You know, incomes aren't rising, the cost of living is skyrocketing, housing costs the price of food, all of these things have really gone up and wages haven't kept up with that. So, you know, people aren't seeing the windfall of whatever economic, macroeconomic numbers and whatever stability, you know, might be seen in the in the big picture. So people really expect whoever wins the presidency to uh, transform the economy, really, and not just piecemeal reforms, but also to fix some of the political problems right. that have been demonstrated over the last three years. Good talking to you. Thank you for talking us through that. Political analyst, uh, Chris ogun Mudede uh, in Dhaka. Thank you. Now, a court in Russia has charged two men over their suspected role in the attack on a concert hall near Moscow that claimed at least 137 casualties. Authorities are continuing to scour the remains of the venue which gunmen set alight after their shooting rampage. The so-called Islamic State has claimed responsibility the claim confirmed by the US and the UK. Russia is observing a national day of mourning after the attack, which the Kremlin has tried to link to Ukraine. A growing mountain of tributes marks the scene of Friday's attack. A focal point for people looking to pay their respects. On Russia's national day of mourning, many were united in their grief and in their shock. People came to a concert. Some people came to relax with their families. And any one of us could have been in that situation. And I want to express my condolences to all the families that were affected here, and I want to pay tribute to these people. It's been a gruelling search for survivors in the Crocus City Hall. Rescue teams scoured the burned building for two days. Search and clean-up teams continue, with more bodies likely to emerge. Overnight, a hole in the main building was created in order to get engineering equipment inside the concert hall and ensure the work of rescue workers. Arrangements were also made to extinguish small fires on the roof of the building. Currently, more than 100 cubic metres of construction debris have been removed. As Russia mourns, investigations into the attack are underway. The Kremlin has been quick to link the alleged gunman to Ukraine. Seen here being marched into a Moscow court, the Kremlin says they were arrested on their way to the border. Ukraine rejects any connection. The so-called Islamic State says one of its affiliates was responsible. President Vladimir Putin has not responded to those claims. He's vowing to punish those responsible, prompting concern from analysts that the Ukraine link may be a pretext to ramp up its military invasion. Security remains tight across Russia as the country comes to terms with its worst attack in two decades. Well, Brian Whitmore is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Centre. I asked him how Vladimir Putin might benefit by blaming Ukraine rather than the Islamic State group. In fact, I would have been very, very surprised if Putin did not blame Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is the enemy of the moment, and therefore they must be blamed for everything. Russian state media, soon after the attack, had received instructions to play up the Ukrainian angle. Um, what this shows us is that Russia is very, very good at focusing on imaginary enemies, whether these are fictitious uh, Nazis in Ukraine or the LGBTQ plus community, for example, which was recently declared a terrorist organization. But it is completely inept at actually fighting actual terrorists. Um, this really does expose that Putin's security state is an utter, utter failure. It's Brian Whitmore.
Now, Poland has summoned the Russian ambassador to explain why a Russian cruise missile violated its airspace on Sunday morning. NATO member Poland said the missile crossed its territory for 39 seconds on its way to hit targets in western Ukraine. Officials in Ukraine say their air defences shot down around a dozen missiles in and around Kyiv. Residents were told to remain in shelters. The city of Lviv, close to the Polish border, also came under heavy attack. Well, Jacek Goryshevsky speaks for the operational command of the Polish Armed Forces, and we asked him why they didn't shoot the Russian missile down. We need to know, we need to be sure that it will, uh, it will not move further to the Polish territory. Uh, and so the, the, the trajectory and the radar data show us that it wouldn't. And mm. uh, it's safer to not, uh, to not destroy the object because of the, of the consequences of it. Yeah? It, it must... Uh, you know, it, it won't burn uh, at the airspace, but it will fall down. The, 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 the object uh, will fall down and you never know where, where it's going to be. So it's safer to, to let them pass away from our airspace. And Marina Miron is a military analyst from King's College London, and she explained how this might have happened. Well, what we have to understand, um, there is a significant difference between cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Cruise missiles fly at low altitudes. They are essentially, if you wish, like an unmanned aircraft. And so they have different guidance systems on board, such as terrain mapping, um, satellite navigation. And they have a degree of maneuverability in order to remain undetected. So to fly beneath the radar. So here is a possibility, while violation of airspace is a violation, regardless of whether it was 39 seconds or three minutes or whatever it might have been, um, the thing here which, which we have to understand, the missile might have tried to evade um, certain air defenses located in Ukraine and therefore ventured briefly into the Polish territory. So you cannot mm. say that you can completely determine the course of the missile. We have seen the Polish defense minister saying they knew that the missile wasn't targeting anything on the Polish territory. They were monitoring several missiles, I think up to 10 missiles, mm. uh, going to leave. Therefore, they knew that this missile wasn't an attack on Poland per se. And as I said, the missiles have a small room of maneuverability in order to evade air defenses. Therefore, it is to assume that it wasn't an intentional incursion into Polish airspace and was not presenting any direct threat to Poland being a NATO member, which is why uh, Poland didn't shoot it down. Marina Miron. We'll uh, remind you of our top story at this hour. Polls have closed in Senegal's presidential elections. Voters had a record field of 19 candidates to choose from, but with an outright win needing more than 50% of the vote, a second round looks likely.